This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam, in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Sorry about the delay everyone, inshallah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asirat Nabawiya, the prophetic biography. Um, in the previous session, we were talking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims arriving at the place of Tabuk for the campaign, the expedition of Tabuk. And what we talked about in the previous session was um, they passed by the ruins of Thamud on the way there. And then what we also covered extensively was the fact that when they arrived at the place of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ delivered a sermon. A really powerful, very comprehensive, um, really amazing and beneficial sermon was delivered by the Prophet ﷺ there. So, after covering that, what we're going to be talking about is what exactly transpired at the place of Tabuk. So if you recall, if you remember, what led the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims to the place of Tabuk was the fact that there was a credible threat. Um, and actually the threat was somewhat directly delivered as well, that the Roman Empire was going to be sending an army. And the number of the army was rumored to be anywhere between 100,000 all the way to 300,000. Um, and so the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, in, with a number of 30,000 people, they went to the place of Tabuk, which is very far north in the Arabian Peninsula, to basically face off and you know head off this potential and very real credible threat that was coming towards the Muslims. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived there, the army never showed up. However, the Prophet ﷺ some, a representative from the Roman Empire did actually come and meet with the Prophet ﷺ there. It's a very fascinating narration that is mentioned in all the books of Sirah, and Imam Ahmad also mentions it in his Musnad. And he narrates from a man by the name of Sa'id ibn Abi Rashid, um, who was a um, who was a tabi'i, he was in that next generation of Muslims after the Sahaba, after the companions. He says, لَقِيتُ أَتَّنُوخِيَ رَسُولَ هِرَقَلْ إِلَى رَسُولَ صلى الله عليه وسلم بِحِمْسِ So he says that many, many, many years later, far after the passing of the Prophet wasallam, when the next generation of Muslims had come along, I actually met a man who was from the people of Tanukh. I met a man who was people from the people of Tanukh. Now these people of Tanukh, who they were, they were these Arabs that lived to the north of Mecca and Medina, that region, the Hijaz. They lived to the north of Hijaz, and they were a Christian people. They were a Christian people. So these were Arab Christians, and they lived far to the north. So he said, I met this Tanukhi man, who happened to be the messenger the representative of Hiraqal, Heracles, who was the Roman emperor. Um, and he was the man who was sent by the Roman emperor to come and meet with the Prophet ﷺ. And he says that I um, met him in the area of Hims. So this is in Bilad al-Sham, what we know as Syria today. So I met him there, and, um, and he says it was very, very interesting. He says, وَكَانَ جَارًا لِي شَيْخًا كَبِيرًا قَدْ بَلَغَ الْفَنَّدَ أَوْ قَرُبًا He says, by this particular time, he was a very, very elderly man. 
he had gotten quite old. And he was, you know, he says that قَدْ بَلَغَ الْفَنَدَ which is an expression in Arabic to mean that he was very, very senior. He was very elderly at this time. So I said to him, can do you mind telling me ala tukhbirni an risalati hiraqal ila rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa risalati rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ila hiraqal he says do you mind telling me about what message the roman emperor at that time sent to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam subsequently responded do you mind in telling me that story he said bala of course not let me tell you the story he says the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrived at the place of tabuk he goes you might remember that the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims arrived at the place of Tabuk. He says when they arrived at the place of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ sent a Sahabi, a companion, by the name of Dihya al-Kalbi. Dihya al-Kalbi radiallahu anhu was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He was known as being somebody who was very eloquent. He was very kind of considered a very sophisticated kind of man of culture. He was well-traveled. He spoke a few different languages. So the Prophet ﷺ utilized him extensively for the purpose of taking messages on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ, talking to different leaders in different places. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Dihya al-Kalbi to Hiraqal. And he delivered the letter from the Prophet ﷺ to Heracles, to the Roman Emperor. When the Roman Emperor read this letter, he called together a lot of his ministers and some of the priests that were part of kind of the close council of the Emperor. And when, he, when they all entered in, he said, close the doors and lock the doors. I need to have a very, very high level, private, exclusive conversation with you. He says that this man that came to visit me that you all saw, he came and he comes on behalf of a messenger, a man who says he's a messenger of God. And they are, they are presenting three options. They are presenting three options. Number one, يَدْعُونِي إِلَىٰ أَنْ أَتَّبِعَهُ عَلَىٰ دِينِهِ Number one is that he asks me to believe in this message that he has brought. Number two is عَلَىٰ أَنْ نُعْطِيَهُ مَا لَنَا عَلَىٰ أَرْضِنَا وَالْأَرْضُ أَرْضُنَا The second offer that they make that if we're not willing to embrace and accept the message, enter the fold of the religion, is that we can continue to live our lives, we can continue to maintain ownership of our kingdom and our lands, all of that, but we will basically pay a tax uh, that will serve the purpose of having an alliance and having a pact with them. And then number three is, or this could lead to battle. If we continue to maintain this uh, antagonistic attitude towards them, we continue to see them as enemies, then this will proceed on towards a fight and a battle. So he, the emperor at that time, he says something very fascinating. He goes, I swear to God, you people know and you understand that... Everything that you recognize what you are reading in this message of his. What he's doing is he's talking to the priest and he's saying that the message that you read from this man is consistent with the message of the prophets of the past. And it is an, it is, I have no doubt about the fact that one day that religion will prevail even where we are standing here today. So my suggestion is that we embrace this religion and follow him, this prophet. Or at the very least, we establish peaceful relations with them and we enter into a pact with them and we're willing to pay that tax that they're asking for. As soon as the emperor says this, the narration, the man tells the story, he says that everyone immediately objected. There was just nothing but shouting that was going on. And people started really, really uh, becoming unnerved and upset and they started lashing out. And they said that you want us to leave our religion and you want us to follow this, these, these uneducated people. That's how they looked at the Arabs at that time. These uneducated people that come from the south, you want us to follow them, listen to them. And when the emperor sensed that these people are not taking this news well at all, and in fact some of them started to kind of look to each other and you know whisper to one another, and the vibe started to prevail in the room that they started to say, you know what, let's leave this room right now and figure out how we're going to handle the situation. 
When the emperor sensed this, that this could lead to a lot of instability here in my kingdom, he called out to them and he says, إِنَّمَا قُلْتُ ذَلِكَ لَكُمْ لِأَعْلَمَ صَلَابَتَكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِكُمْ I was only testing you to see if you would remain firm and steadfast upon you know, our way of life, our religion, our kingdom, our politics, if you would stick to it. I was testing you. And he says then, go and find a trustworthy person who happens to be from the Arab Christians. And the reason why he wanted somebody Christian was also obviously because he wanted somebody that could represent them and their position. But he said, find me somebody who's reliable and trustworthy from the Arab Christian so that he speaks the Arabic language um, so that I can you know, give him a response and he can deliver that response on my behalf to this man who says that he's a messenger. So he says, that's where I came into the picture. They called me. And I was presented before the emperor, and he wrote a response saying that, no, we do not accept your position. Um, and then he called me close, and he said that there are three things that I want you to observe on my behalf. There are three things I want you to observe on my behalf. Number one, هَلْ يَذْكُرُوا صَحِيفَتَهُ الَّتِي كَتَبَ إِلَيْكَ بِشَيْءٍ Number one is, See if he brings up the letter and the message that he had sent. Does he refer back to the original message that he had sent? The letter that he had sent, the offer that he had made. Number one. Number two, when he reads my letter, see if he brings up, if he mentions, if he says, any, says anything about the night, a layl, night time. Which sounds like a very strange thing, right? which will make sense in just a moment. He says that when he reads my letter, pay attention to see if he talks or brings up the night, night time. And number three, I want you to try to get a look at his back and see if there's something out of the ordinary on his back. So he says these are the three things. So the man who's telling this story now, the messenger from the emperor of Rome, he says that, I left, I departed from there, I had the message from the emperor, I arrived in Tabuk. When I arrived in Tabuk, the Prophet wasallam, he was sitting with some of his companions, muhtabiyan. Muhtabiyan basically means when you kind of sit on the ground and you kind of wrap your arms around your knees. And the reason why he mentions that, it's, that's a way that, you know, it, it's seen as kind of like a commoner's way to sit. A king doesn't sit like that on the ground with everybody else, kind of just holding his knees up. Right? A king basically would sit on some type of a makeshift throne or something. So he was sitting there amongst the people and they had a bowl of water between them and they were all kind of drinking water and just sitting. So when I approached the gathering, I said, where is your leader? And they pointed, they said, Hahua. Hahua da. This is him right here. So I went and I sat down in front of him and I gave him the letter from the emperor. He took the letter and he put it on his leg, he put it in his lap, and just put it down there. And then he said to me, he asked me, Mimman anta, where are you from? Like, where do you belong to? He said that I told him, Ana akhu Tanukh, that I belong to the people, the tribe of Tanukh. Then he asked me, Hallaka ila al Islami al Hanifiya millati abika Ibrahim. Have you considered Islam? which is actually the continuation of the legacy of your forefather Abraham. What the Prophet ﷺ was talking about here is something that you know we talk about quite often. He was basically talking about the Abrahamic tradition. Because he knew the people of Tanukh were Christian. So he said, okay, this conversation is easy. You're a Christian. You grasp the legacy and the message of Abraham, the Abrahamic tradition. So have you not considered Islam, considering the fact that it is a continuation of that tradition? He, he says, the messenger says, I responded by saying, look, I am a messenger coming on behalf of a people, uh, a kingdom, and I follow the religion of that emperor and that kingdom. And I will not abandon I will not revert away from that religion until I fulfill the task 
that has been assigned to me and I go back to him and fulfill my task. That's when I can consider something else, a change of heart. But right now, I have a responsibility to fulfill. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, فَضَحِكَ The Prophet ﷺ smiled, like he laughed, he kind of chuckled. And he said, that's, that's good. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, he recited the ayah of the Qur'an, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ The Prophet ﷺ recited the ayah that Allah had revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Al-Qasas, ayah number 56, that, O Messenger, O Muhammad ﷺ, you cannot guide those whom you love, rather Allah guides whomsoever He, he wills, and he knows best who are the rightly guided. What the Prophet ﷺ was hinting at was that, look, you are a good man, you are a moral, ethical, responsible individual. I see a lot of good in you. I would love for you to embrace the sun right now, but it's obviously when Allah has written guidance for you, that's when you will get guidance. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, Ya akha tanukh. He said, oh my tanukhi brother, listen to me. He says, I sent a letter to the emperor of Persia. He ripped it up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy him and will destroy his kingdom as a result of it. And he says that I wrote to other kings letters as well. And some of them ripped them up and tore them up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them accordingly. I wrote to your king as well. But he held on to the letter, he read it, and he responded to it. So he says that nevertheless, the people will continue to suffer the consequences that are a result of the choices that their leaders are making. If he opposes me, that's bad for him and that's bad for his kingdom. If he accepts my message, it's good for him and good for his kingdom. That's what I'd like to tell you. So he says that at that point in time, I kind of made a mental note he brought up the letter. And the reason for that, now as I ex- go through this, I'll explain. Why was the emperor so keen on whether he brings up the letter or not? Because if he's a messenger, truly sent by God, rejecting his offer is not just rejecting the offer of any ordinary man, or a leader, or chief, or king. It is rejecting the message of, of God, of Allah. And so if he brings up the letter that he had sent, that means that he's trying to communicate the fact that, listen, tread very carefully. Because you don't defend me. This is not an offense to me. But this is an offense to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you reject this message, you reject the message of Allah. Not just of a king or a ruler. Because that's not what I am. I am a messenger of Allah. So that's the first thing. So he said, I, I noted that he did bring up the letter. And he did talk about the severity of this message. So he says, I did not want to forget. I wanted to write down exactly what he said. So he said that I didn't have anything to write with. So what they would have a lot of times at that time is that they, you know, a sword, carrying the sword was very commonplace. Obviously, you'd be traveling long distances, middle of nowhere, there was no other safety, protection, police, security, anything like that. So people used to carry their weapons when they would travel. So he said, so a lot of times what they would do is the, the sheath of the sword, so that it wouldn't injure the person themselves, it, the sheath would be covered in leather. So what the sword would go into, there would be a sheath, but then on the outside of the sheath, the, 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 the case for the sword, it would have a leather covering. Just so that you're wearing it, so it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't cut you or anything like that. So because that was leather, I didn't have anything else to write. He said, I also had a quiver, like that had arrows in it. I had bow and arrows with me as well. So I took out an arrow, and I took the sheath of my sword because it was leather, and I started carving into it what he was saying. Like I took my notes in that leather by carving into it. And of course the Prophet ﷺ saw that he was writing something down. Then a man who was sitting to the side of the Prophet ﷺ, the left side of the Prophet ﷺ, the man says, um, he picked up the letter. And when he picked up the letter... And he started reading the letter because obviously that was understood by the companions. The Prophet ﷺ did not formally read and write. So he put the letter in his lap. 
The man came and he picked up the letter and he started reading the letter. So he says, I asked the Prophet ﷺ, Man sahibu kitabikum alladhi yaqra'u lakum? Who is this man that's reading the letter on your behalf? So some of the people responded, said that man, his name is Muawiyah. This was Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan. He was a young companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He was a brother-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ. His, his sister was uh, Ramla bint Abi Sufyan, known as Ummu Habiba, one of the mothers of the believers. All right, so he himself was a Muslim as well. Muawiyah was a very educated man. He knew how to read and write, and he was actually one of the Kutabul Wahi. He was one of the scribes of divine revelation. He used to write the Qur'an when it would be revealed to the Prophet ﷺ and he would recite it. Muawiyah was one of the people who would write it. So he said, this is Muawiyah. So, فَإِذَا فِي كِتَابِ صَاحِبِي um, the, 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 the emperor had written something strange in the letter. And Muawiyah read it out loud. And what he had written in the letter was, تَدْعُونِ إِلَىٰ جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You call me to paradise. You call me to paradise. He wrote to the Prophet ﷺ, the emperor did, that you say that aslim taslam, right? That accept Islam and you will be safe. And God will reward you with paradise. جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ That a paradise that is as vast as the heavens and the earth, وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And it has been prepared for those who have God consciousness, people of taqwa, people of God consciousness. So, فَأَيْنَ النَّارِ Where's the fire? He asked, where's the fire? Is there a fire? Like if you're promising me paradise, if I believe... Is there a fire of hell? Is there a hell? What is hell? Is there a hell? Like he kind of asked that question. And look at the response of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Subhanallah. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. Right? He said, Aina laylu idha ja'a naharu. He says, when you have the day, don't you have night time? Ah. Remember? Amazing, isn't it? See, and, and, and this is what's remarkable about this, is the fact that what the emperor had said to his close kind of council, the court, what he had reminded them of, is that, look, you, and even what the Prophet ﷺ had said to the person of Tanuh, you are familiar with the Abrahamic tradition. You are familiar with prophets and messengers and their message and scripture and things of that nature. This is an obvious continuation of that same tradition, that same message. So the emperor, who was actually a very well-versed person in his own Christian tradition, was aware of the fact that one of the common examples given in previous scriptures, when giving the example of good and bad, paradise and hell, is the day and the night. And don't we find that in the Qur'an? وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا Talks about the sun, talks about the moon. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَخْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى Talks about the night and talks about the day. Throughout the Qur'an constantly. So he knew that and that's why he told him, listen to see if he talks about the night time. And immediately the Prophet ﷺ says, أَيْنَ اللَّيْلُ إِذَا جَاءَ النَّهَارُ When you got daytime, you obviously have nighttime. Right? So he says again, I, I picked up my arrow and I took that sheath of the sword and I kind of wrote in there, I kind of carved in there again what he had said. And the Prophet ﷺ could see that I was noting something down. Then after he was done reading, Muawiyah was done reading the letter from the emperor of Rome to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he then said to this messenger, he said, look, we're done here. For all intents and purposes, we're done. You know, your emperor is not accepting my message. He kind of sent back like, you know, some questions and a bit of a cryptic response. And basically the gist of it is, is that we are not accepting the offer. Okay? So, but nevertheless, you've come all the way here to deliver this letter, this message. You are our guest. We're travelers as well, but you are our guest. So he says, إِنَّ لَكَ حَقًّا وَإِنَّ لَكَ رَسُولٌ You have a right upon us. You are a messenger. And it was part of the custom of that time, that if a messenger comes from another party, even if it be your enemy, you have to honor and give hospitality to the dignitary, to the diplomat, the messenger, the representative. فَلَوْ وَجَدْتُ عِنْدَنَا جَائِزَةً جَوَّزْنَاكَ بِهَا He says that 
if I can find something to kind of reward you with, kind of, you know, uh, pay you for your troubles, for your time, I will offer it. Because, inna safrun murmiluna. We are number one travelers. We're not at home. If you came to Medina, it'd be a different story. We're travelers. And number two, murmilun. This comes from the word ramal. The word ramal means sand. It means dirt. And it's like an Arabic expression that we kind of have like, you know, a similar expression. It's kind of like saying you're dirt poor. The Prophet ﷺ said, we're simple people, we don't have much. We're simple people, we don't have much. So we're travelers and we're already, we're very simple people. We're poor, we don't have much. But if I can find something, I'll give you something. فَنَادَاهُ رَجُلٌ مِنْ طَائِفَةِ النَّاسِ قَالَ أَنَا أُجَوِّزُهُ a man from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ called out and he said, Oh Messenger of God, I'd like to give him something. I, I have a gift, I'll give it on your behalf. So the man went and he opened up like his bags, right? Like everyone was, they were traveling so everyone's got a bag. So he went and he opened up his bag and he pulled out a garment. And the garment is described as being safuriyah. Safuriyah. This was a particular type of garment that used to come from the south. It used to come from Yemen. It used to come from the south and it was considered like a very nice garment to wear. So he pulled it out and he came and he gave it to me. The messenger says that man pulled out this garment of his and he came and he put it in my lap. He gave it to me. So I asked, who's this man that's giving this gift on behalf of, you know, the Prophet ﷺ? قِيلَ لِي عُثْمَانِ Somebody told me his name is Uthman. This was of course Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The very generous companion of the Prophet ﷺ and his son-in-law. ذُو النُّورَيْنِ The man of two lights. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, أَيُّكُمْ يُنزِلُ هَذَا الرَّجُلُ Who can kind of take care of the hospitality of this man? This individual, who can host him? Now they're travelers, what does it mean to host someone? What that means is, who can maybe kind of, you know, give him some place to sleep, make sure that he eats before he goes to bed, like who can take care of that hospitality? So a man, a young man, قَالَ فَتَمْ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ A young man from the Ansar, he said, Anna, I will take care of that. And the Ansari man stood up and he said, please come with me. So I got up and I went with him. When I... When I started walking away, and I had gotten a little bit far away, like the gathering, let's say this was the gathering, the Prophet was sitting with the companions. When I had gotten a little bit away, like I was in the lobby area, when I was out there, Nadani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called me. He said, Ta'al ya akha tanukh. Come here, come here my tanukhi brother. Come here, come here, you forgot something. <laughs> he says, you forgot something. So he says, I came back to him, and until I was standing there in the gathering again, and then the Prophet ﷺ, he stood up, and he pulled the shirt down from his back, and he said to me, "Ha huna amdi lima umirta bihi." Here, this is the last part of your responsibility. Look, and he says, "My mind was just blown at that moment." And he says that, I looked very closely at his back. And I saw that there was this mark, which is known as a seal of prophethood, in between his shoulder blades. And it looked like a, like a cluster of moles. Like a cluster of moles. And I saw that there at that point. And then he goes on to say that I basically went back to the emperor, I gave him the news, of how the Prophet ﷺ had responded to everything. And he said, once I discharge that responsibility, then I accepted Islam. Then I accepted Islam. So this was the remarkable interaction the Prophet ﷺ had with the messenger from the Emperor of Rome at the place of Tabuk. Now, what that message basically made clear to the Prophet ﷺ was that the emperor would, did not accept the invitation from the Prophet ﷺ to enter into the fold of Islam. That did not happen, number one. Number two, they did not come into like that peace agreement with the Prophet ﷺ where they would be making, also a part of that would be some financial offerings to the Muslims. That was not accepted. But at the same time, even though the Prophet ﷺ said that the third option was that this could lead to conflict, but at the same time, he assured the Prophet ﷺ that I'm not sending an army, and we are not engaging in conflict, at least not right now. At least not right now. 
So the Prophet ﷺ, they had been camped out there at the place of Tabuk for about 20 days. They had been there for about 20 days. At this point in time, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba that we're going to start making preparations to head back to Medina. But we'll talk about the journey back to Medina in the following session. Today what I wanted to also touch upon was, before returning back to Medina, before going back to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ said, while we are here in this region, there's a couple of things I'd like to take care of. And this is very, very important. A lot of times these types of uh, details, or even I shouldn't even call them details, but these particular narrations, these incidents that I'm about to touch on, are considered details. They're almost kind of considered like little small, you know, uh, minutia, details. They're not important, they're not significant. And that's part of the problem. Because when we do not study them, we don't understand them, we don't talk about them, we don't learn about them, we don't teach them, then there's a huge confusion that occurs within Muslims and even non-Muslims. And there's a huge part of the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ, at turath al-Nabawi. There's a huge part of the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ that becomes ignored here. The Prophet ﷺ said, before we leave the north, before we leave Tabuk, there's something that I'd like to take care of. What was that? The Prophet ﷺ said that there are two tribes here, Christian tribes, and I would like to establish peaceful relations with them. Do you understand why that's so significant? Because wherever, whenever, there's a conversation about the life and the times of the Prophet ﷺ, and they're the Muslims, the, 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 at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, their dealings and their interactions with other people at that time, it seems to be that all that was going on was fighting and war. And then we're always on the defensive basically ask, answering the question, was the Prophet ﷺ, um, God forbid, well, ayyadu billah, but was he a warmonger? Was he bloodthirsty? Was he a tyrant? Right? Was, was that all they cared about? Was war and fighting and battle? Of course not. We know that's not the case. But we also don't educate ourselves on the proof in regards to that. So this is right here, the Prophet comes all the way in the north, these are small tribes, Christian tribes, and the Prophet is concerned about establishing peaceful relations with them before he leaves the region. So Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Kathir, and many others, Imam Bayhaqi and Dala'il al many of them, they mentioned that once the Prophet ﷺ basically concluded, he reached a conclusion that we are done here in Tabuk, there's nothing more to be done here, the Prophet ﷺ visited with um, two people. The first one I'll talk about is Yuhanna ibn Ru'bah, who was the chief of the people of Ayla. Ayla was a region there in northern Arabia, and these were Arab Christians. And their leader, his name was Yuhanna ibn Ru'bah. The Prophet ﷺ visited with him, فَصَالَحَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet ﷺ formed a peaceful alliance, a peace treaty with them. Not only that, but the people of Jarba and Adruh, the people of Jarba and Adruh, these were also another Arab Christian tribe that lived to the north. The Prophet ﷺ is met with them, visited with them, and also established peaceful relations with them. And the Prophet ﷺ wrote a letter. What that means is that Prophet ﷺ dictated a letter. And this is what's really remarkable. First he dictated a letter that was to be given to them and that they were supposed to hold and keep. What did that letter say in it? It said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I began with the name of Allah, the, the most uh, merciful and the constantly compassionate. Hadihi amanatun min Allahi wa Muhammadin Nabi Rasulillahi. That this is a, an offer of peace. This is a peace offering. This is the establishment of peace from God and from the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad ﷺ. From Allah and from Muhammad ﷺ. This is a peace offering of peace. Another version, another narration uses the word, هَذَا كِتَابُ مِنْ مُحَمَّدٍ نَبِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لِأَهْلِ جَرْبَى وَأَدْرُحْ أَنَّهُمْ آمِنُونَ بِأَمَانِ اللَّهِ وَأَمَانِ مُحَمَّدٍ that the people of Jarba and Adruh are safe and sound and secure, and this safety to them is guaranteed by Allah and by Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah. 
And the Prophet ﷺ goes further. He says, Sufunihim wa sayyaratihim fil barri wal bahri. Their ships will not be harmed in the seas, and their caravans will not be harmed on the land. No Muslims are to lay a finger on them. Lahum dhimmatullahi wa Muhammadin nabi. That they are under the protection of God and under the protection of Muhammad, the Prophet of God. وَمَنْ كَانَ مَعَهُمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الشَّامِ وَأَهْلِ الْيَمْنِ يَمَنِ وَأَهْلِ الْبَحْرِ Not only that, but the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, not only that, but anyone who has peaceful relations with them, the people of the Levant, the people of Asham, the people of Yemen, whoever it may be, anyone else who has peaceful relations with them is also included under this. Muslims will not cause them any danger, will not cause them any harm. The Prophet ﷺ gave them this letter, and not only that, but the narration says, وَأَعْطَى النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَهْلَ أَيْلَةَ بُرْدَهُ مَعَ كِتَابِهِ أَمَانٍ لَهُمْ The Prophet ﷺ took off the shawl that he was wearing. He took off the shawl that he was wearing, he folded it up, and then put that letter that had been dictated by the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba Muawiyah had written it. The Prophet ﷺ took that letter, folded up his shawl, put it on top of the letter, and gave it to him. And then he said, I give you my shawl as proof of the fact that this letter is from me. Look at the generosity, look at the compassion, the mercy, and also the benevolence, the peace-driven mindset of the Prophet ﷺ, the peaceful philosophy of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is something that's very, very important. We talk about it quite often. We allude to it, we refer to it, but we're not very, very well acquainted with it. It's very important that we start to educate ourselves in regards to it. And so, what we talked about here today was the fact that the Prophet ﷺ at the place of Tabuk met with the messenger from the Roman Empire. The Prophet ﷺ you know, that miraculous interaction occurred where the Prophet ﷺ talked about, you know, basically through that miraculous knowledge given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proved the prophethood. Um, the Prophet ﷺ showed such character and dignity and integrity to the messenger of somebody who is potentially an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. And that led to the man becoming Muslim. And not only that, but then the Prophet ﷺ travels to the north where there are people of other faith, another faith and another religion, the Christian Arabs to the north, and the Prophet ﷺ establishes peaceful relations with them. And after concluding all of this business, the Prophet ﷺ then returned back. The Muslims, all they, they all returned back to the city of Medina. And um, inshallah, we'll go ahead and stop here. I know that we didn't cover uh, too much and I know there's some time left, but that is all I had prepared for. So inshallah, uh, that's where we'll go ahead and stop. Uh, I bring this up from time to time, I remind it to the students as well. We were taught with a lot of discipline, and we had a lot of very admirable teachers and scholars who kind of taught us the discipline, that there's no winging it in Islam. It's not an admirable trait and quality to wing it. Everybody understand the lingo, wing it, like when you just kind of, you know, off the top of your head, just kind of go for it. That's not how Islam works. Alright, that's not an admirable thing. But it is very important, you know, subhanAllah, I'll tell you something really, really amazing and remarkable. I actually visited one of my, I, I visited my te- some of my teachers uh, just, uh, you know, maybe about a month ago. And one of the teachers that I was visiting, um, when I went to go visit him in his home, he was sitting there and he was reading. And he was reading the book of Sahih Muslim. It's a compilation of hadith called Sahih Muslim. He was reading it, and he had like four or five different books, and he was reading all of it, and taking notes, and looking up stuff. Um, and I just kind of asked him, you know, I have a good, friendly kind of relationship with him. I asked him, what are you doing? But I asked him in a kind of joking kind of way. I'm like, well, what are you, seriously? Like, what are you doing? And um, he said, I'm, I'm studying, I'm preparing for my class tomorrow morning. And the reason why I kind of jokingly asked him is that he's been teaching Sahih Muslim. He's been teaching Hadith for about 45 years. And he's been teaching the book of Sahih Muslim for about 30 years. 32 years to be exact. And I just kind of asked him for my own benefit to kind of, you know, learn from somebody experienced, a veteran. I kind of said, and you still prepare? He said, every single day. You read and you study. Because... This endeavor isn't just about knowledge, like just information. This endeavor isn't just about information. And it's not even just about the knowledge. 
It's about your connection with that knowledge and your transformation through that knowledge and how that knowledge helps you become a better person. How that knowledge connects you and brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how that knowledge helps you become more like the Prophet wasallam in your character, in your demeanor, in the choices you make, in how you live your life. And ultimately makes you more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the objective of the knowledge. And something that's really amazing is we were studying just in class today with the students, the Qur'an is a sea without shores. The Qur'an, بَحْرٌ لَا يَنْتَهِي It's a sea without shores. The life of the Prophet ﷺ is al-kanz. Al-kanz الَّذِي لَا يَنْتَهِي It's the treasure, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And what that means is that when I was 20 years old, when I studied an event from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there are certain things I learned from it. But then when I was 30 years old, there's different lessons I'm still learning from it. The same event, but because I'm at a different point in my life. I'm experiencing different things. My perspective has changed. My point of view might have grown. And I'm learning more from it. And then when I'm 40, I'm still learning from it. Right, so that's kind of the idea. So this is something that we always take very seriously, and we should always study and you know come with the utmost humility and respect whenever we learn and study our religion. Uh, so to summarize, that's my excuse of why we're stopping early. All right. So may Allah subhanahu wa taala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala allow us to learn from the character of the Prophet sallallahu the dignity, the integrity, and the mercy and the compassion of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi. Um, Jazakum Allah khairan Inshallah we'll continue on uh, Next week May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Accept from all of us Subhanallah Bihamdihi Subhanakallah Bihamdik Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta Nasakfiruka wa natubu ilayk Mm-hmm.